Lisa here, and I've got a tale that took everyone by surprise, especially my family. So what happened? Well, I ended up selling our house. The news hit like a bolt of lightning. My husband was beside me, equally floored. But if you think we were shocked, you should have seen my mother-in-law's reaction. It was as if the ground beneath her had vanished. Why on earth would you do something like that? She blurted out, unable to hide her disbelief. And weren't you supposed to come and pick me up? She was staring right at my brother-in-law, Peter, as if trying to piece together a puzzle with missing parts. Her voice was a mix of hurt and confusion, and it was clear she was really upset with Peter's revelation. Peter, trying to smooth things over, urged her to calm down. He began to explain the reasons behind our unexpected decision, but let's backtrack a bit to give you the full picture. My husband Jason and I have been working remotely for a while. We loved the flexibility it gave us, being able to work in a tranquil environment, taking breaks whenever it felt right. It was our little slice of paradise. Then, my mother-in-law moved in. Don't get me wrong, we were financially okay, so hosting her wasn't a problem. But soon, questions began. Why aren't you two going out to work? She'd ask eyeing us with a hint of disapproval. Her questions felt like a heavy weight, pulling me down into a sea of doubt. This wasn't new. When she first brought it up, we tried explaining the concept of remote work to her, but it didn't quite stick. But aren't you just playing around? She would challenge us, her tone dripping with skepticism. I've mentioned this to Jason too. Are you even listening? When will you start taking life seriously? What about your future? It was clear she couldn't wrap her head around our lifestyle. I'm so worried. Did I make a mistake coming here? Maybe I should have gone to Peter's place, she'd often lament. Speaking of Peter, he's Jason's brother, married to Olivia, a woman of considerable wealth. Peter's living quite the comfortable life, thanks to Olivia's fortune. We were asked to keep this detail from my mother-in-law, on Peter's request. This situation set the stage for our shocking announcement and the whirlwind of emotions that followed. It was a moment we'll never forget, revealing layers of misunderstanding and concern within our family dynamic. In our family, Peter's home is often talked about as if it's a grand palace from a fairy tale, sprawling and magnificent, quite unlike our modest abode. My mother-in-law frequently dreamt aloud about moving to Peter's place, which she fancied would eventually become her residence. She'd sit by the window, daydreaming of the day Peter would arrive to whisk her away to his mansion. Deep down, we all knew that day was unlikely to ever come. This wasn't just a baseless assumption. There was a time when Jason, trying to look out for his mother's best interest, suggested to Peter that perhaps she could live with him, given his ample space and resources. Peter, however, was quick to dismiss the idea. And so, our living arrangement continued as it was, with my mother-in-law often lamenting our remote work as unemployment, unable to grasp the concept of our digital careers. We had grown to accept her views as part of our daily life, not expecting much to change. Then, an unexpected call from Peter threw everything into disarray. He announced he'd be visiting that weekend and promptly ended the call, leaving no room for questions or preparation. Jason and I were taken aback by his abruptness, which hadn't diminished over the years. Our conversation caught my mother-in-law's attention, her face lighting up with hope and anticipation. She was convinced Peter's visit was for her, to finally take her to live in his castle. Please, help me get ready to move, she urged pulling Jason towards her room to start packing. Jason, caught in a difficult position, tried to gently correct her misunderstanding. Mom, Peter didn't mention coming to take you with him. It seems he's visiting because of something else. But she was dismissive, holding on to her conviction that her departure was imminent. He just forgot to say it, Jason. I'm tired of being here, feeling like nothing more than a housekeeper in waiting but I won't let that be my fate. We were perplexed by her reaction, unable to grasp where her fears and accusations were stemming from. 
especially since she had been part of our home without any demands or expectations of servitude. Her paranoia and disappointment painted a stark contrast to the reality of our life together, highlighting a chasm of misunderstanding we had yet to bridge. My mother-in-law enjoyed a rather comfortable life with us. She woke up at her leisure, wasn't expected to help with household chores, and even received some spending money from us. Despite this, when she expressed a desire to leave, we respected her wishes. We packed her belongings and awaited the arrival of my brother-in-law and his wife. Their visit over the weekend brought a sense of unease. The moment they stepped through our door, something felt off their smiles were too forced, their greetings too calculated. My instincts told me trouble was brewing. As if on cue, my mother-in-law appeared, her eyes gleaming with what seemed like triumph. She wasted no time in painting herself as the aggrieved party. Oh, you finally come, you won't believe it. Lisa can hardly manage any housework, and Jason completely neglects me. It's dreadful here, she lamented, pushing past us to greet her son with open arms. Jason quickly came to our defense, explaining, that's not true at all. She's been living comfortably here, not needing to lift a finger, and enjoying the meals and space freely. But my brother-in-law seemed unconvinced, suggesting, perhaps out of loyalty or misunderstanding, that Jason and I might be mistreating her without even realizing it. My mother-in-law nodded along, playing the role of the victim perfectly. Despite our frustration, Jason and I kept our cool and welcomed everyone to the living room for tea, trying to maintain a semblance of hospitality amidst the tension. The situation took an absurd turn when my mother-in-law demanded tea, acting as though it was outrageous that she might make it herself, especially in front of her visiting son. Her performance included tears, accusations, and an air of martyrdom that left me too shocked to even respond. After serving the tea, the atmosphere shifted abruptly when Peter revealed the real reason for their visit. We've sold our house, he said, visibly uneasy. This bombshell left everyone stunned, but none more so than my mother-in-law, whose face fell at the news. Why would you do such a thing? Weren't you supposed to be here to take me with you? She demanded, her voice a mix of confusion and accusation. Peter attempted to soothe the situation, explaining their dire financial straits. The sale of their home had been a desperate measure to clear debts, and now, with no place to go, they were hoping to stay with us. This revelation changed everything, casting the day's earlier tensions in a new, sobering light. Peter shared with us, almost too casually, the reason behind his sudden visit. I tried to start my own business, but it didn't take off. These things happen, right? He said, managing to laugh off his predicament. Both Jason and I couldn't help but sigh deeply at his nonchalance. Despite the lighthearted way he spoke, the gravity of the situation was clear. We just need a place to stay until we can find a new home. Please we have nowhere else to turn, Peter pleaded, with his wife nodding in agreement beside him. Their faces were a picture of desperation. Faced with their plight, our initial frustration gave way to a reluctant understanding. Despite the complicated feelings swirling within us, the bottom line was they had no place to go. We agreed to let them stay, on the condition that it would be a temporary arrangement, lasting no more than a month. Peter, still in his oddly cheerful mood, agreed quickly and went off to prepare for their move. After their departure, the house fell silent, with my mother-in-law lost in thought. Jason and I wondered if she was still processing the shock of Peter's financial debacle. The next day, Peter and his wife's belongings arrived in droves, overwhelming us with their sheer volume. Where are we going to put all of this? We wondered aloud, facing a logistical nightmare. The idea of having to possibly sell some items or rent a storage unit was being seriously considered when my mother-in-law made a startling suggestion. I've been thinking, she began, having Peter here could secure our future. So why don't you two leave? You don't really contribute anything. Her words were sharp, and she specifically targeted me, 
suggesting that without me, there would be more room for Peter's belongings. She even went as far as to suggest that Jason and I should divorce to make space. Her proposal was shocking, and she looked expectantly at Jason for support. What are you talking about? Jason responded, his voice filled with disbelief at the turn of the conversation. However, before we could delve deeper into this outrageous suggestion, Peter and his wife walked in, greeted warmly by my mother-in-law. Despite the turmoil caused by her words, Jason decided to set the conversation aside for the moment and address the immediate issue of the clutter. Addressing his brother, Jason made it clear that the sheer amount of stuff was overwhelming. You'll need to figure out what to do with all these things. Maybe sell some or rent a locker, he advised, trying to manage the situation as best as he could. Peter, however, didn't take well to this suggestion, showing a hint of annoyance. These are important items. I can't just sell them. What if they get stolen or damaged in a locker? Are you going to be responsible for that? This exchange highlighted the selfish streak in Peter, who seemed more concerned about his belongings than the strain their presence was putting on our living situation. Jason, trying to maintain peace, reminded him, This is our home. It's only fair that you try to accommodate us while you're here. If the arrangements aren't to your liking, it might be best to find another place sooner rather than later. The conversation was abruptly interrupted by a shout from my mother-in-law, signaling another chapter in our ongoing domestic drama. In a moment that felt surreal, my mother-in-law made a declaration that took everyone by surprise. She boldly suggested that since Jason and I were apparently not content with Peter's situation, and what she perceived as our lack of contribution, it would be best if we left. According to her, we were nothing more than freeloaders, taking up space while Peter was attempting something ambitious with his business venture. Our remote work, she dismissed as mere idleness, an unnecessary presence in what she implied was her domain. The room fell silent, the words hanging heavy in the air. Jason and I exchanged looks of disbelief, unable to comprehend the audacity of her claims. Peter and his wife, Olivia, initially taken aback, quickly masked their surprise with smirks, seemingly warming up to the idea. Yeah, that actually sounds like a good plan, Mom, Peter chimed in, with Olivia nodding in agreement. It's a hassle finding a new place so why not just stay here? Better yet, why don't you sell us this house? It would be much more convenient for us, especially since you seem uncomfortable with Lisa and Jason's presence. Their words struck us like a bolt from the blue, their audacity rendering us speechless. The notion of selling our home to them, on their terms, felt like a bizarre twist in an already strained conversation. My husband, gearing up to refute their outrageous proposal, was abruptly cut off by my mother-in-law, who seemed to take delight in the unity of Peter and Olivia's suggestion. She turned her triumphant gaze towards me, insinuating that a divorce would somehow validate their plan, allowing Jason to remain. Before I could muster a response, Jason's patience snapped. How dare you speak like that? Lisa is not leaving, he asserted, his frustration boiling over. His outburst was met with a call for calm by my mother-in-law, who continued to press her point, insisting on the convenience of my absence. However, Jason had reached his limit. You don't get it, do you? This is Lisa's house, he stated, a revelation that silenced the room. My mother-in-law, Peter, and Olivia were visibly shocked, their expressions frozen as Jason continued. This is the home Lisa bought for us to start our life together. The air was thick with tension as the reality of the situation dawned on them. Our home, the very subject of their entitlement, was not theirs to claim or negotiate over. It was a testament to our shared life, our struggles, and our achievements, a place they had no right to challenge. In a moment filled with tension and disbelief, my mother-in-law challenged the reality of our household dynamics with a scoff, suggesting that traditionally, it should have been Jason, my husband, who took on the financial responsibilities of purchasing our home. 
Yet in our family, there were no such conventional roles. I had taken the lead, covering not just the mortgage, but all of my mother-in-law's living expenses and allowance, stepping in because her pension was modest and hardly enough for her to enjoy any semblance of financial freedom. Jason, with a look of frustration and disbelief, countered her outdated views, emphasizing that I had willingly shouldered these responsibilities to ensure her comfort and well-being. Despite his clear explanation, my mother-in-law laughed off the idea in disbelief, mockingly accusing me of spending my days idly and insisting that her allowance must be secretly funded by her own pension, given that, in her eyes, I couldn't possibly afford such generosity on my own. Her accusations escalated, boldly claiming that I was mishandling her pension and demanding that Jason divorce me on the spot, suggesting a future where he, along with Peter and Olivia, would be better off without my alleged deceit. Standing my ground, I refuted her baseless claims with tangible proof, my paycheck a testament to my success and independence. The document visibly shocked her and the others, silencing their unfounded allegations. I explained that not a penny of her pension had been touched for her living expenses since she moved in with us. If anything, it was her constant interference and unjustified demands that were the real issue, not my alleged incompetence or dishonesty. I stood firm, stating that if she found our arrangement so disagreeable, she was free to leave at any time. Jason, backing me up, addressed Peter and Olivia directly, reminding them that their stay was meant to be temporary and born out of necessity, not preference. His stern tone, a rare occurrence, visibly unnerved them, marking a clear boundary and expectation of respect within our home. Attempting to lighten the mood, or perhaps realizing the gravity of the situation, Peter made a flippant remark about the surprising amount I earned. Yet, the undercurrent of tension remained, a clear reminder of the challenges and misunderstandings that had come to light, prompting a moment of reflection on respect, responsibilities, and the true meaning of family support. In a moment of unexpected warmth, Peter and his wife, Olivia, acknowledged the misunderstanding and misconceptions about me. Maybe we could learn a thing or two from you, Peter said with a smile, suggesting that my business acumen was not only impressive, but also something worth emulating. Despite their newfound respect, my mother-in-law remained steadfast in her disdain dismissing my contributions and insisting that both Jason and I were nothing more than obstacles in her and Peter's path to success. Her words were sharp, filled with a conviction that left us no choice but to confront the reality of our situation. If that's how you see it, we'll find a new place to live. I said, the weight of our decision heavy in the air. You'll have to manage the mortgage on your own. And remember, we won't be around to help if you find yourselves in over your heads. The thought of maintaining her lifestyle without our support seemed to strike a nerve with my mother-in-law, but her pride quickly overshadowed any signs of worry. As we stood firm in our decision, Peter and Olivia attempted to intervene, their earlier acknowledgement of my skills now mixed with panic at the thought of us actually leaving. However, my mother-in-law, ever determined, silenced their protests with a fierce glare and a challenge for Peter to prove himself as a future CEO by using her pension to start his own company. With her words echoing a finality, we decided it was best to sever our ties and move forward without them. In time, we transferred the house's mortgage to Peter's name and started anew, finding peace away from the constant criticism and unrealistic expectations. However, our respite was short-lived. One day, while settling into our routine in our new apartment, my mother-in-law's voice, now laced with desperation and regret, came through the phone. She was crying, revealing that Peter had taken her pension and vanished, leaving Olivia and her to face the consequences of their decisions alone. Please, can you help us? She pleaded. After calming her down, Jason sought to understand the full scope of Peter's disappearance. The cycle of decisions that led to this moment was a harsh reminder of the complexity of family dynamics, 
and the consequences of pride and misunderstanding. In a heartbreaking turn of events, my mother-in-law revealed that she had entrusted her entire pension to Peter, hoping to support his entrepreneurial dreams. However, Peter's aspirations quickly turned to dust as he squandered the money on gambling, leaving nothing but despair in his wake. When she tried to confront him about his reckless actions, Peter vanished without a trace, unable to face the consequences of his decisions. Overwhelmed by emotion, my mother-in-law couldn't continue the conversation, so Olivia took over the call, her voice trembling with distress. She explained their dire situation. Peter's failed venture had led him to sell the house, and as a result, they were now estranged from their parents. Olivia's plea for help was a desperate attempt to salvage what little they had left of their lives. My husband's response was a mix of frustration and resignation. I knew it, he said, a clear indication of his disappointment in Peter's actions. Despite Olivia's appeals, he made it clear that our assistance would not be forthcoming. We had warned them of the potential consequences before we parted ways, and now they were facing the harsh reality of their choices. My husband advised Olivia to report Peter missing to the authorities, emphasizing that their predicament was no longer our concern. After the call, my husband was adamant that they were experiencing the fallout of their own decisions. Although they reached out to us multiple times, seeking guidance on how to navigate their situation, we kept our involvement to a minimum, advising Olivia to contact the police or help with finding Peter. As it turned out, Peter's disappearance was linked to a far more serious issue than we had anticipated. He was arrested in another state for bank robbery, an act driven by desperation to clear his gambling debts. It wasn't his first run-in with the law, and this time, it seemed certain that he would face significant jail time. Olivia, now stranded with nowhere to turn, remained with my mother-in-law. The prospect of divorce from Peter, though likely among her least concerns, hung in the air as yet another decision she would have to face in the wake of this family tragedy. Olivia found herself navigating uncharted waters, having registered with a temporary job agency. Despite the challenges and being new to the workforce, she's managing to scrape by making ends meet with her very first job. The situation at home grew more complicated when it came to light that Peter had not only squandered his own future, but also that of his mother. With her pension gone to cover Peter's gambling debts, my mother-in-law was forced into part-time work, a situation she never imagined she'd find herself in, to chip away at the mountain of debt left behind. While my husband and I felt a pang of sympathy for the difficult road Olivia and my mother-in-law were forced to walk, we stood firm in our decision to not provide assistance. We've chosen to sever ties, believing it's crucial for them to face and navigate these challenges on their own. This decision underscores a belief that sometimes, experiencing life's sternest lessons is the only way to truly understand and appreciate its value. Despite the turmoil that followed my mother-in-law's stay with us, my husband, and I have found solace in the return to our tranquil life. The events that unfolded served as a reminder of the unpredictable nature of life and the importance of making wise choices. As for Olivia and my mother-in-law, they're on a journey of their own, one that is undoubtedly tough, but also filled with opportunities for growth and redemption. Despite what you might think, I've already ended the lease for our apartment. Confused? Let me explain. My mom suggested we should cancel our rental agreement, so together, we went ahead and did that while you were away on your work trip. This is unbelievable. I can't continue living with such irrational people. My mother-in-law, Linda, thought that by ending our apartment lease, I'd have no choice but to move in with them. But I'm determined not to give in to this pressure. I simply refuse. What are you even saying? You're his wife. It's expected of you, someone insisted. But my response was clear. Then I'll seek a divorce. My name is Mary, and I'm a 34-year-old who works in an office. My husband, Larry, and I tied the knot a year ago. 
We both work for companies that collaborate frequently, which is how we met. Working together led to us hanging out privately, eventually dating, and finally getting married a year later. Life with Larry was joyful. He's upbeat and humorous, and we shared many laughs living together. I truly believed I had married an amazing person and was overjoyed with our life together. However, I was soon to discover an unexpected side of Larry. Five months into our marriage, we spent our first New Year's Eve at my in-law's house. Before this, my interactions with Larry's parents had been minimal and brief. But that New Year's visit revealed their true colors. The gathering included my parents-in-law and my sisters-in-law, Nancy, who is single, and Emily, who is married with a young son, Justin. Emily's husband had gone to visit his own parents, leaving Emily and Justin with us. Until that point, I had a good impression of my in-laws, finding them as cheerful and approachable as Larry. I hoped for a pleasant and normal conversation during the visit. Unfortunately, things didn't go as expected. Mary, could you lend me a hand? My mother-in-law Linda asked, pulling me into the kitchen. As I followed, her friendly smile vanished, replaced by a cold look. You're quite slow. Normally, you should have offered to help without needing to be asked, she scolded. Feeling a rush of apology, I was worried I had somehow upset her. Eager to mend the situation, I did my best to contribute and hopefully win back Linda's approval. Yet, Linda's harsh criticisms didn't stop. She accused me of acting entitled because of Larry's kindness and questioned why I was still working instead of focusing solely on family life. Larry only agreed because you insisted, didn't he? You're not acting like a good wife at all, she scolded. She criticized me for not being more involved when visiting their house, claiming I ignored household duties and only added to Larry's burdens. Feeling hurt by Linda's relentless barbs, my spirits lifted slightly when Nancy, one of my sisters-in-law, entered the kitchen. We had shared pleasant chats before, so I hoped for her support. However, to my dismay, Nancy joined in the criticism, disparaging my cooking skills in front of everyone. This was completely unexpected, and I was stunned by her harsh words. It seemed both Linda and Nancy had chosen this moment to be particularly cruel, a side of them I hadn't seen before. The New Year's celebration at my in-laws, which I had hoped would be enjoyable, turned into a deeply uncomfortable experience. Despite the ongoing feast, I couldn't find joy in any of it. Linda and Nancy kept the conversation among themselves, discussing topics only relevant to their family, leaving me feeling excluded. Larry, oblivious to my discomfort, didn't intervene. Linda's demeanor only worsened when she noticed my disinterest, commanding me to serve drinks as if I were a servant, with no one questioning her behavior. As the evening finally ended, Larry, having had too much to drink, announced his intention to stay over. Unwilling to endure any more, I managed to get him into the car and drove us home, leaving the unpleasantness behind. The next day, I reflected on the entire ordeal, pondering the unexpected turn of events and the cold treatment I received from those I had hoped to consider family. I decided to have a conversation with Larry about the discomforting experience I had at his family's house. Larry, Linda, and Nancy were really mean to me, I started. Larry seemed surprised and dismissive. That's hard to believe. We were all enjoying ourselves. You're probably the only one who feels that way. I tried to explain how Linda and Nancy had said some pretty hurtful things to me in the kitchen, but Larry doubted such an event, questioning whether I was making it up. When I pressed further, he excused himself, citing a hangover and a headache, asking to delay the discussion, which he never revisited. Later, Larry mentioned we were expected at his sister's house soon, for Justin's birthday. Without considering my feelings about our last visit, he insisted I attend and even pick out Justin's birthday gift, despite my busy schedule. After much thought and despite my reservations, I selected a gift I hoped Justin would enjoy. At Justin's birthday party, my effort seemed to pay off when Justin expressed genuine joy for the present I chose. Emily, assuming Larry was behind the thoughtful gift, thanked him. I waited for Larry to correct her, but instead, he took the credit claiming extensive research went into selecting Justin's present, leaving me astonished and unacknowledged. I was thrilled to see Justin's happiness with the gift I had carefully chosen for him. 
Yet, my satisfaction turned to disbelief when Larry claimed the credit for the thoughtful present. Before I could process this, Linda's voice snapped me back to reality, urging me to hurry up with the cake. Confused? I asked. What cake? As I genuinely had no clue what she was referring to. Linda then shocked me by accusing me of forgetting the birthday cake she allegedly told me to prepare. I didn't hear anything about that, I protested, but my confusion only seemed to irritate her further. What kind of partner are you? Didn't you prepare the cake? She pressed, making it clear that she believed I had been informed. Admitting I had no knowledge of the cake only drew disappointed glances from everyone. Linda then labeled me as negligent, causing distress not just for me but for Justin, who burst into tears, upset over the absence of a birthday cake. Linda's consolation to Justin, blaming the oversight on me, only added to my dismay. How could you be so thoughtless? She scolded, as if the mistake was mine. Looking to Larry for support, I hoped he'd clarify the misunderstanding, knowing well that Linda had never asked me about the cake. To my astonishment, Larry sided with Linda, accusing me of being a poor wife and implying I had intentionally upset his family. Just when the situation couldn't seem more dire, Nancy stepped in with a cake she had supposedly bought, just in case. Justin's mood instantly changed for the better at the sight of it, and Linda lavished praise on Nancy for her foresight. Nancy then took a dig at me, suggesting she had anticipated my negligence. It was in this moment I realized the trap that had been set for me. Linda and Nancy had orchestrated this scenario to paint me in a negative light, cleverly manipulating the situation to their advantage. The situation took an unexpected turn when everyone blamed me for forgetting the birthday cake, branding me as a negligent wife. There wasn't a single ally in sight, even Larry joined in, accusing me of causing distress to Justin and declaring that I should leave as a form of punishment. You shouldn't expect to stay for the meal or enjoy the cake after causing such trouble, he said, supported by Linda, Anne, and Nancy's insistence that I go home. With no other option, I left Anne's house, embarking on the long journey back to our place alone, reflecting on the irony of having selected Justin's present during my work time. That evening, Larry chose to stay at his parents' house instead of returning home. When he finally did come back the next day, he confronted me with allegations of harassing Linda and Nancy and deliberately forgetting the birthday cake, as if I had some vendetta against his family. You're a terrible wife, he concluded, taking Linda's word over mine. I was stunned, not just by the accusations, but by his unwillingness to hear my side of the story. Wait, you're taking their word over mine? And you're accusing me of neglect when you claimed credit for the gift I chose for Justin? I challenged. Larry brushed it off, saying it didn't matter since the gift was from both of us, missing the point entirely. It dawned on me that Larry was more interested in maintaining his image with his family than in standing by me. His actions and words stripped away any affection I had for him, leaving me to contemplate a future without this marriage. If this pattern continued, I realized, seeking a divorce might be the only way forward. As I mulled over the idea of leaving, an incident occurred that made up my mind for me. I had been away on a business trip for two days, unaware of any developments at home. Upon my return, I was met with the shocking sight of Larry's belongings neatly packed into cardboard boxes. Confused and alarmed, I reached out to Larry, who abruptly ended the call with a promise to return home soon. My frustration grew as I awaited his explanation, but to my surprise, Linda, Anne, and Nancy were with him when he arrived. Larry, what's happening? Why are your things packed, and why are they here? I demanded. Larry, with a smirk, announced, We're moving out. Moving? To where exactly? I asked. Bewildered. To my mother's, he stated plainly, as if it was the most natural decision. Stunned, I protested. Why are you deciding this without discussing it with me? Linda interjected, accusing me of being childish and insisting I should simply agree with Larry's decisions. However, I stood my ground, emphasizing that as a married couple, Larry and I should make such significant decisions together. To my utter disbelief, Larry revealed that he and his mother had already terminated our apartment lease while I was away. This revelation left me speechless. 
I couldn't believe Larry would make such a drastic move without my consent, effectively leaving me with no say in the matter. Faced with the reality of moving in with Larry's family, a prospect I was adamantly against, I reached my breaking point. You're suggesting that as his wife, I have no choice but to follow? I clarified. Exactly, Linda responded, convinced of her argument. In that moment, with clarity and conviction, I declared, then I'll divorce him. It was clear that staying in a relationship where my opinions were disregarded and where unilateral decisions were made without my input was not an option. The decision to leave was no longer just a consideration. It was a resolution. When I declared my intention to divorce, Larry was visibly shocked, unable to believe I was serious. You can't be serious about wanting a divorce, he stammered, but I firmly stated my resolve, tired of the endless drama with his family. Larry's face paled at my words, and the room fell silent until Emily and Nancy, unable to contain themselves any longer, objected vehemently to my decision. You can't divorce. Who will look after our father if you leave? Emily demanded, unwittingly revealing their true motives. It turned out their father had recently suffered a fall and required care, which they had hoped I would provide. Their reaction confirmed my suspicions that they had been plotting to burden me with the responsibility of caring for their father, a task none of them wished to undertake due to their self-centeredness. Their accusation of me being a useless wife only fueled my determination to leave. So, it's clear now. You were hoping I'd be the one to care for him, I pointed out, exposing their selfish intentions. Their defensive and aggressive responses did nothing but reinforce my decision. As the argument escalated, Emily and Nancy, in their frustration, suggested I might as well divorce and leave, thinking their words would hurt me. Instead, I took them up on their offer, starting to pack my belongings right then and there. This sudden turn of events caused Larry and Linda to panic realizing the gravity of the situation and the inconvenience my departure would cause them. They scrambled to retract the harsh words with Larry pleading for me to reconsider the divorce and Linda suggesting a compromise where I could help by becoming a full-time caretaker for their father, even trying to sweeten the deal by painting it as an opportunity for me to become a stay-at-home mom. Facing this last-ditch attempt to manipulate me into staying, I stood firm. Unfortunately, I began, ready to make my final stand against their selfish demands, signaling the end of my patience and the start of a new chapter for me, free from their manipulations. Declining the role of a stay-at-home mom, I revealed to them something perhaps unknown. My salary exceeded Larry's due to my career progression at the company. I had been the main contributor to our apartment's rent, which wasn't cheap. This revelation highlighted the irony of their disdain for me despite my financial contribution exceeding that of their own family member. With nothing more to add, I bid them farewell and left, leaving them in visible shock. I temporarily moved back to my parents' home and promptly sought legal counsel to initiate divorce proceedings against Larry. Larry, looking defeated, quietly consented to the divorce. In a twist of fate, Linda's attempt to delegate the care of their father to Emily and Nancy backfired as they outright refused the responsibility and chose to distance themselves instead. Moreover, Emily's personal life unraveled as she faced a substantial alimony demand following her spouse discovering her infidelity. Nancy accused Justin to living under her mother's roof and relying on Linda for morning wake-up calls struggled with independence. Her habitual tardiness, a result of her newfound freedom, ultimately cost her job. Larry, coerced back to the family home by Linda due to his status as the eldest son, found himself bearing the brunt of caring for their father. Overwhelmed by the dual responsibilities of work and caregiving, his exhaustion was palpable. Tensions between Larry and Linda escalated, leading to frequent arguments that disturbed the neighborhood peace to such an extent that police checks became a routine isolating them further as the community distanced themselves from the family chaos. In contrast, I embraced a fresh start, securing a pleasant apartment close to my workplace. Enjoying my independence, I settled into a comfortable life, free from the turmoil that once clouded my days. The unfolding consequences for Larry and his family served as a stark reminder of the repercussions of their actions, affirming my decision to leave and rebuild my life on my own terms. I'm contemplating picking up a new hobby, 
especially since I'm not keen on diving into another relationship anytime soon. The whole experience with Larry and his family has been eye-opening. They had this tendency to dump all responsibilities on me, painting me as the villain in every scenario. Larry, despite earning less than me, had the audacity to be domineering, which was just pathetic. And then there were Anne and Linda, each wrapped up in their self-centered worlds, making it almost unbearable to be around them. However, seeing them entangle themselves in their own mess was somewhat satisfying. I'm rooting for Mary to discover a new passion or hobby that brings her joy and fulfillment. After everything she's been through, she deserves all the happiness and peace the world has to offer. Here's to Mary's fresh start and to her finding contentment and excitement in life's next chapter. Thanks to everyone who stuck around till the end. Don't forget to subscribe for more updates. Catch you in the next video!